yeah when i squeeze that don't move <laughs> put if you okay i'm gonna say i'm gonna say if you get some calipers but by calipers i mean vernier calipers yeah um, get some calipers and put them over the caliper and squeeze the brake you'll see the numbers the numbers move no way yeah that's yeah. amazing and what that's kind of pressure uh all right taylor i'm gonna try something new here normally what i do is i go back and i edit the podcast and i add an intro yeah but someone told me this thing like if you skip the first like 30 seconds or three minutes or something of a youtube video you don't actually miss anything so i think we should just like do no intro and get straight into it and that is the intro obviously we're here to talk about breaks yes i mean yes we are i love breaks i don't know i think breaks are like the coolest part of a bike do you feel the same way uh i've definitely taken a lot of interest in them <laughs> i guess to put it uh, bluntly but um yeah i mean you know it's, it seems like such a simple thing like it's only meant to slow you down you know and th at the end of the day that's what it's there to do but it's you know it can get quite complex of us um you know like the braking system ends up being quite complex once you actually take everything into account um but yeah i don't know i find it quite interesting <laughs> i would think like the brakes would be one of the most complex parts to make because there's like fluid inside a lot of moving For parts sure. i think you'd to have be... to go 50 50 split between brakes and suspension yeah suspension that that stuff's that stuff's complicated too but yes i'd say brakes and suspension got to be like the hardest parts yeah, yeah. So, so how did you get into this whole engineering thing um so i've always been interested in engineering specifically mechanical um so i went and got my degree and all that sort of rubbish but um do you learn anything oh yes yeah <laughs> i think i definitely learned a lot there was also a lot we didn't learn um which you know you come to know after you finish that you know you finish your degree but um that no, was great it, i guess it started me down this path for sure like i've been riding mountain bikes since i was a little kid and i've always you know raced motorbikes and stuff like that and so you know i've always been interested in the mechanical side of things and always wanted to pursue something like that so i'm currently i guess you're doing i'm doing motorsport engineering but really want to shift that to my passion which is mountain bikes yeah so i guess it's you don't keep it a secret that you work on like race car stuff no and not that, really i mean lots of people ask what i do yeah. and that's essentially what i do as a day job yeah um yeah which is unfortunate at the moment but you know it is what it is but well, yeah no, be I guess it's busy because you made a break from scratch like yeah. a whole mountain bike break yeah that was a big that was a big task and it still is it's ongoing you know developments i'm going i always want to make it the best so yeah it's part of the challenge but yeah super busy work we, yeah fortunate enough to start early and like a bit earlier so start at seven finish at four and then come home and work on breaks <laughs> yeah nice yeah. i think um when people i guess because the the name radic has been ar around for a while and people maybe heard about it what was it like 2019 maybe yeah that's the one you yeah. had this idea to do a 3d printed cow yeah yeah so i ended up we well, actually it was 2019 so it was my last year of uni and we'd been told that we we're going to be getting some metal printers at uni this is at auckland and i was kind of we were to family took a mountain bike trip and we went to whistler for a week and a bit and um it's basically sitting on the chairlift thinking of like all the crazy stuff oh, that's the cat um all the crazy stuff that you know what can i print for my mountain bike like is there anything cool like to do a stem or some cranks or something and then um the bugatti 3d printed titanium caliper popped in my mind and i was like that'd be sick <laughs> i want to learn how to do that and then do that so got home after the ride on the chairlift at once the park had closed and whipped out the cad and started drawing some stuff i was like actually this might work <laughs> um and so it started you know started with the whole how light can i make it and quickly realized that that's not really the route you want to take with you know brake systems i guess you know yeah you, you obviously want to chop weight out and stuff like that but 
um, you don't want to make it as light as possible because <laughs> you're no. going to lose out on a few other features that you want. Yeah, so. I think the that trend. Well, that's I guess people still want light bikes, and but also people want some heavy parts, right? Like heavier tires are going to yeah. hold up better. Yeah, um, and to a certain extent, heavier brakes and. On our list, we have to talk about rotors as well. Maybe we'll have a rotor debate, but you know, maybe heavier rotors help you ride better. Yeah. But this, what, what's the reason that Bugatti made a three a three D printed caliper? Because they weren't trying to save weight, were they? Um, at the end of the day, I think they were, and like in Bugatti's case, it's a little bit different because a lot of the time they are trying to showcase the best technology, and so it's not always about you know, use the technology appropriately where you can to get improvements where appropriate. Um, and in motorsport, you know, unsprung weight and all that, they're trying to make brake assemblies and wheel assemblies much lighter so you get better performance. Um, I don't think Bugatti ever actually put that brake caliper in production, but, you know, I guess it sparked a whole, you know, it's... It's an appropriate place to use 3D printing, I would say, because you get quite a lot of complex geometry and this you know, allows you to do complex things where traditional machining or manufacturing methods wouldn't allow you to do. So you can print all the oil lines inside the brake. You don't have to machine them and all that sort of stuff. So you can get a lot of complex stuff out of it for no extra cost because the printer is just going to print where it, you know, where it prints. It does what you say, right? Exactly. Printing. Mm. Wow. Mostly. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, w so, why'd you stop? I mean, it obviously sounds like a hard thing, but I remember seeing your caliber at uh, Crankworks. Yep. Uh, but obviously, since then, now you're you've gone to whole whole CNC machine system. Yes. What were like the those challenges that you had making the three D printed break? Um. So. Yeah, when you saw the caliper, we'd kind of. The caliper was working, caliper was running. Um, it performed perfectly fine. It was just a matter of appearance. You know, at the end of the day, you know, it's not a cheap part to make. It's not going to be a cheap product. But I wasn't happy with the surface finish I was getting, um, mainly because the bottom side where all the support material is is still quite rough. And so we couldn't really dial in the printers to make it look good. And so I didn't feel comfortable putting a high quality product in the market, um, charging the appropriate amount for that, and then, you know, not being happy with what it looked like at the end of the day. Like, I don't know. It was, yeah, I just wasn't really keen on it. So it's still working, it's still in the background. But um, since then, you know, to get the 3D printed caliper, you know, so that people could buy it, I'd have to develop a lever. So I started developing the lever, and there wasn't much 3D printing benefit to that. So it was always going to be a CNC machined lever. Well, it might still be. I'm not really sure yet. But from there, it was kind of I developed the lever to work with the 3D printed caliper, and then I was like, oh, I could just you know do a CNC machine caliper as well because <laughs> it was yeah. taking quite a lot of time, and I was chewing up my spare cash and savings and that sort of stuff. So I guess I was kind of like getting something to market just so that I could help fund the development for the 3D printed stuff. So kind of did a bit of a pivot and here we are now. Um, the 3D printed caliper is still in the works. Still want to get it to market. I don't know when, but um, I've got some wicked ideas for it, which is going to be so cool when I actually <laughs> get to do it. Yeah. But um, until then, we're just trying to get the Kaha, Kaha going. So. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say like you weren't happy about the finish. I thought that thing looked cool. It was like it was a wicked shape. Like in general, the shape, the organic shape, was actually really cool, and I loved that part about it. But it was just, yeah, it came down to surface finish and fit and finish, you know. And it was just like if someone opened the box, it would look cool. But then they go, oh, probably actually, you know, this isn't that nice, or that's not that nice. And it's like you never want someone to open a box and be like. I'm disappointed in what I paid all this money for, you know. So yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's just what I don't want. So oh, yeah, it's going across again. <laughs> Cats love doing that. Eh? It's yeah. COVID era; no one cares anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you're listening to this, you can also check it out on YouTube. 
we're trying to put videos on YouTube. Well, put the podcasts on YouTube now. So just so more people can see it. Um, yeah. So, okay. So that's interesting. So maybe one day the 3D printed caliper will reemerge. Yeah. No, definitely. I'm feeling confident about it. But yeah. I'm just going to put the time in it and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're busy enough. And, you know, it's it's funny with 3D printing because um, we've 3D printed a bunch of parts. And yes. we always like 3D print them and uh, to make sure it fits. And then 3D print, uh, all our plastics are 3D printed. Yeah. And like sometimes, like if you get certain grades of 3D printing, it looks really bad. And there's no way that you would ever want that. As a product. Ever. Yeah, never ever. But there's some that actually look really good. Yeah, they do actually have like, especially like the plastics. I got the plastics dialed in for sure. Do and that's because like they don't, yeah. I think the biggest thing with the metal printing is like, the top side finish looks really nice and you get to see the cool layer lines and it actually adds quite a nice feature to it because you can look at it and you can be like, that's 3D printed. Um, and you can get the same strengths now. They've got better materials in the dial and the printer so you actually get the right strength out of it. Um, but yeah, it's just the underside because with metal printing, you actually need to suck the heat out of the part as you print it um, just to help aid with distortion and all that sort of stuff. So you actually need to hold the part with much more support than you would with a standard plastic part. Um, right, so it's so about managing heat distortion and heat dissipation because you're essentially welding, mm. you know, layer by layer, you're welding the particles on. So does that mean then when you take the part out of the printer, it's been touching the bottom yes. more often and that's the oh. part that kind of looks ugly? Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's actually stuck to the bottom side of the part and you have to first of all cut the part off at the base and then you're left breaking off the support material you've actually got to get pliers out and you know break them off and cut them off and sand them off and that sort of stuff yeah no so it doesn't leave a very nice finish afterwards <laughs> yeah well the finish on your cnc machine breaks the kaha yeah that looks awesome yeah, no, nah, that's really nice. I'm really happy with that. And it took a little bit of getting right, but it's, it's there now. So Yeah, so when you switch then to doing the the CNC machined brake, like everything, every yep. single part, did you run into any like similar roadblocks like you had with the the 3D printed? Um, there were definitely roadblocks. I wouldn't say similar. Um, because the 3D printing like allowed you to do the oil holes and oil routes inside of it as part of it. Going to the CNC machine one, it means like, you know, you have to now drill those oil holes and oil routing. So it's a lot more complex because you actually have to get special machines. You know, you could have a fourth axis to rotate the part up or even a fifth axis because you've got compounding angles where you actually just need to drill a simple hole, but it's on a real funky angle. But you need to do it the same every single time, you know. You can't just whack it in a drill press. Um, so, yeah, there's, like, challenges like that that I've definitely had to come across and got to find the right supplier that can, you know, has that machine and can do it for a reasonable price and those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. How many parts would be in a break? Because I look at it, I'm like, well, you got the caliper, which I assume is two parts that you then bolt together. Yeah, it's two major parts. Um, pistons. Got, got pistons, seals, O-rings, bleed ports. Um, that would be the caliper. And then the lever, you know, you got your lever blade, your main body, you know, your bar clamp, a reservoir cap, a piston, a push rod, piston retainer, circlip, seals for that, bladder, you know, everything's custom. And then even hoses, like I've got my own custom titanium fittings that I'm using. So, um, yeah, there's two parts per end there. Yeah. How many <laughs> parts all together? Is there like oh, 50, 100? Nah, I would say it would be in the realm of 50 parts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, per, oh, no, nah, probably less than 50 parts per side. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, still a lot of custom parts. Yeah. And you made all of them? Not personally. <laughs> yeah. I'd be here all day. But um yeah. So everything's designed. Yeah, I've designed everything. Um got a bunch of the prototype stuff made around New Zealand and still am getting prototype stuff ready around New Zealand. But 
yeah uh, so like how, like obviously since you made all the parts how does a break actually work because i think we take it for granted honestly we take for granted like even the cheap brakes like sometimes i was i just recently bought a bike it was like a cheap uh, single speed just because i wanted to i don't know why i bought it it was like a thousand dollars uh at the evo cycles i was like you know what i'm gonna get that thing just because i wanted a single speed for some reason so anyway it came with the cheap shimano brakes yep which are like you know they're made cheap right yeah and they're they're not made to be like super high performance they're literally stamped just stamped out you know it's, ah. and it's insane well, yeah forged cast yeah right so that's like the what it, it's like a metal powder that's then pressed into a mold and oh it depends how they do it mm -hmm. yeah sometimes aluminium is pretty good because you can actually forge it pretty easily yeah um casting they they're just pouring liquid metal into a mold which you end up getting castings quite weak compared to billet you know, yeah forging well um, i remember uh that in uh what was it i think they're called u-brakes maybe that they used to that are on you know cheap bikes the yeah. cheap um they look like a U, and there's a cable that pulls them, and yeah. you can kind of like bend them. They're never ever straight, and you always need yeah. to like recenter them. They don't stay very well. But when you if you bend them too many times, they break. break off. Yeah, you break bend them twice, right, and then they yeah. break, and you're like, ah, oh, it's like white metal in there. Yeah, like well, that's not that strong. It's like, yeah, yeah. It looks but like the crazy thing is, like even on those cheap disc brakes. They still are not that bad, right? Like you could still, like, still under the wrong yeah. person, they could grab a handful of brake and flip over the bars, right? They could do, and they're under the right circumstances. Yeah, I believe so. Which is like, it's, it's not quite, what you want, but no, it's not what you want. You want to actually be able to control your power. But yeah, it's interesting. Like, it's at the end of the day, it's a simple system, but it's complicated. Like, at the end of the day, it's just one piston at one end, pushing oil, pushing pistons at the other end. Like, it's, I would say it's considered a relatively simple hydraulic setup, but with so many different factors, it's just so complicated. Um, you know, and people, you know, under the touch of your finger, you can really tell the difference between, you know, different setups, which is quite amazing. But, you know, you become quite picky and people know what they're like and you know here we are so <laughs> yeah you, you know what i like is i like a break that is there when i need it yeah like yes it's, you know the classic thing is and i guess this is just stems from the way you have to test ride a bike like you go to the shop or whatever you pull one out that you like the look of you go for a loop around the parking lot the pads yeah. are probably not bedded in. You bounce on the shocks. Yeah. You check the seat height. You're like, dang, these brakes are strong. <laughs> and then you're like, nah, don't want it. <laughs> right? Or you, you get a different bike or whatever. Or yeah. but people always say they're like, Oh man, these brakes are touchy. I'm like, yeah. yeah, well, that's good. That's exactly what I want. Like, I want my brakes to be there yeah. as soon as I touch them. And there are some brakes that uh, they're just not as good like you could take them to the parking lot test or whatever and you can grab a handful and it take you like a little bit of time to slow down that's yeah. not what i want when i'm out on the trail because it just means i have to break earlier yeah yeah and obviously you'd know that from you know having the brake ice sensor and you know knowing you'd be able to compare you know if you put a a bad set of brakes on a bike you'd clearly see that you'd actually you know you ended up like trail breaking almost to you know before you come into the you know well before you actually need to on a good yeah. set of brakes you know would you believe it that that's not something I, i've never done like a back-to-back -back brake test like a bad like a bad break versus good break. we could yeah. sort that out yeah <laughs> do you have a, a pile of bad ones sitting around no i've only got oh. a pile of good ones yeah yeah <laughs> that's yeah well uh, yeah keen has to try them um but I guess the one thing, like that's what I like with a break, is that when it that's right there when I ask for it. And uh, I think if when people try good breaks, and this is the problem. Um, for example, hey, I I go 
between like Hayes and Magura, right? Yeah. And they're there when I ask for them. Yeah. Which is what I want. And uh, people try them like, and that too powerful. <laughs> like, hmm, I don't know. Like, that's really what you want when you start riding because when you're riding, you're however fast you're going, you need it then, right? Yes. You don't want to have to break earlier. So I think in a way, this parking lot test has not helped us because people are are doing a parking lot test on a bike with really good brakes. And they're saying, no, I don't want to use those brakes. They're a little bit scary. They're too powerful. Yeah. Give me the bike with those cheap brakes and I'll be much happier. Yeah, it's interesting for sure. Like I'm the same. I personally, you know, this is why I wear it, why I'm here now making breaks but i personally like the same like i i want to be able to rely on my breaks when i need them and it, i know it gives me a lot more confidence especially when i'm going down sketchy trails and stuff like that like i don't i've been in situations where i've grabbed a handful of brake and it hasn't been able to lock up my wheel and i absolutely hate that like i would prefer to have more power and be able to control it and learn to be able to control it than not have the power when I need it the most. Yeah. That that is like I've had so many crashes where I just haven't had the brakes to stop me. Um, you know, going down something super sketchy and just it not being there to help. So Yeah. Well anyone listening to this that's ridden V brakes or is from like the V brake mountain bike era, <laughs> they would get that. And I um I, I remember when the first disc brakes came out and uh my first pair of disc brakes were the Avid BB7s, which were like revolutionary because then you could get actual disc brakes on a $1,000 bike. I was like, oh man, this is crazy. But then my next set of brakes was this Magura Marta. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they were uh, notorious for just losing pressure. Yeah. So I remember it quite vividly at the Mount Snow uh, XC National Race blasting down this like techie downhill with my Magura Martas tiny rotors, tiny calipers, and they just were losing pressure down the descent, so they were to the bar. But yeah. I knew that was going to happen, right? Because they did yeah. that all the time. So just let them go and then pump them up like while I was descending, and that they were back. We're back, baby. And then we could descend, no problem. Yeah. Um, but th I guess that's why, like obviously they've sorted them now because I, I use the MT5s, and they're yeah. sick, and they're there when I want them um but yeah those days of disc brakes were scary yeah yeah and even like you know i guess there's probably a bunch of people out there maybe listening or not but they probably have similar situations and sometimes it's just down to servicing you know like you need to actually service your brakes and you need to look after them you know, so when you say servicing days. what do you, what do you mean when you say servicing well, I guess servicing is like a really broad term, just like, you know, getting your car service, like could be anywhere from an oil change to actually sorting out your tires or replacing bearings. Or yeah, who something. makes that decision? I don't know. Manufacturer <laughs> at the end of the day, I guess. They're like, oh, well, I well, want a service. And they're like, well, all right, well, I'll fix everything and charge you for it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I always exactly. wonder, because that's a New Zealand term, is like... Uh, servicing. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. I'm like, I don't know, even know what they're going to do. I, I just want an oil change yeah yeah exactly <laughs> they end up changing filters and all sorts of stuff yeah which is good but you know then they end up paying for it um i guess a service on a break like yeah it depends i guess yeah it depends on how much you ride but the main things you should be looking at when you know you take your brakes for a service or something is you know the main things the easy ones to look at are pad wear and rotor wear um those are what you can see, you know, and you can tell if your pads are low, you can see it. If your rotors are cooked or burnt or black or got oil on them, you can generally see it or you can hear it because it squeals. Um, those two are the easy ones to look out for. Burnt brake fluid is something that you can't really see, but, you know, when your brakes get hot or over time, they end up absorbing water. Um, you can't, it's not something you can see, but it's something that you should do depending on how much you ride, you know. Um, yeah. Obviously, same as your, your suspension. Like the more you ride, the more you should actually service them. But yeah, I guess like I know back in the day, I never used to service my brakes probably as much as I should. You know, no yeah. one really does. It's a generally it's known as a quite a dirty job. You know, or complicated. You know, 
actually trying to, you know, bleed certain brands' brakes is, ends up being quite difficult. Um, and you never end up getting them feeling the way you want them to feel and all that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, I must admit it is not my least, or is not my favorite thing to do is service my brakes or like bleed them or anything. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, actually, those all those things you mentioned, like uh, the the oil and the, the pads and the rotors, we actually, that was our last episode. So Rowan and I talked about his experience with uh, not bedding in pads properly. And I think he was talking about how he blew through them. Uh, so he's he's been sick, so that's why he's not here today. But we had some good banter about uh, some blown out breaks. Um, we always regress to talking about breaks for some reason. I guess it's the nature of what we do. <laughs> Interesting topic. Yeah. yeah. So you say it's simple, though. How does it actually work? You're just you. You say that it's just pushing fluid around. What's actually happening? If, like, I know we don't have like we don't need engineering drawings, but if you could just like give us the the basics for someone who's listening and can't see how your hands are moving or um, <laughs> yeah i'll do my best to explain it without hands <laughs> uh, no, you can use them because then people can log on on youtube and check that out yeah. <laughs> no uh essentially so when you're squeezing your bra squeezing the lever there's a bit of a mechanical system there um and it depends on which brand of brake you use but sometimes they get more Um, some brands they make it a bit more complicated to get a bit of a different feel so they use cam cam lobes and things like that where there's a lot of friction um, but that way you can actually get you can tune your lever travel so like how far your finger moves to how quickly your brakes grab but then because you're on a cam lobe kind of system you can get a lot of travel at one end a lot of travel and not a bunch of force, but then it changes as you move and you get less travel and more force. So like Shimano and SRAM brakes, they have a system that generally works something like that, depending on which model you have or older versions or new versions. But that's one way SRAM get quite a touchy on off feeling brake is they have that a lot of travel and then a lot of force kind of thing. So it's not very intuitive. But from there, you end up pushing on a piston, and the piston pushes the hydraulic fluid down the line, and then it pushes that fluid into the caliper, which ends up pushing the pistons, which clamp your brake pads. So that's a simple way of putting it. Um, Inside the caliper, because I know, at least this is how I think it works, correct me if I'm wrong, you have two pieces of a caliper yep. that are, they come separate they obviously need to be faced really nicely because they need to touch each other yeah and inside each side you have well yours are four piston brakes so yep. you'd have two pistons on each side i and what i see is i see the the hose going in on one side yep so for that fluid to then cross over and to also push the pistons on the other side there must need to be like some sort of really complex it's like a bridge kind of thing you know yeah like you need a, to bridge the caliper like a and tunnel so, or a, like a yep. kind of system inside. Yeah, so that's the oil routing that I was talking about very early on in this podcast. But basically, you need to you need to connect both sides. And so generally what they end up doing is you drill down on you know, two angles. So if your pistons are in the center, you drill down on two angles. And so your oil could come in and then flow through the pistons up and then around to the other side. And so on Shimano caliper, uh, actually on the older SRAM calipers and stuff like that, I think on the older Shr Shimano ones as well, it would come in one side, split into the two halves, and then go into the two calipers where, two halves where you had the two pistons there and two pistons here. And so it would come down and split into the two. And on the calipers that I've designed, I've actually done it in a big loop. So the oil has to come down one side, around, and then up the other side. And then that way, when you're bleeding, you can actually flush the oil all the way out and you kind of loop all chambers like sequentially. And then that way, the air doesn't get trapped in one side and not the other. And I know, um, I think Hayes do this where they have a port on either side. Yeah. So that's an example of a caliper that's actually split at the entrance. So the oil comes in and then splits both ways and then goes down each side. And so to flush each side of the caliper, you actually need to, bleed it from both sides to flush the oil 
the air out. Um, but I decided to do just a big loop because um, I thought that would be a bit simpler and it has proven to be a bit simpler. So, yeah, saves you having to actually bleed your caliper from two. You know, you don't have to do the same thing twice. Yeah, I must admit, I, I do have those brakes and I didn't do that. <laughs> Bleeding both <laughs> sides. And that's why the rear one, um, I didn't get the maximum performance out of them. Yeah. Unfortunately, because I rear, didn't bleed it properly. Yeah, rear brakes are notoriously harder to bleed. Is it because That's of the longer it. hose? It's the longer hose, and oh, you might not actually be able to see on the bike behind, but generally they go along the chainstay at the back, right? And then some brakes, especially mine, it goes, you know, it goes on the top end, top side of the chainstay, and then it comes down and then back up the bottom tube. And so you get this high point. And so when you're actually bleeding from the bottom, the air comes up and then sits in the little high spot, and then it doesn't want to go back down, so it never will, you know. It takes quite a lot of effort, and you'll never get a proper bleed unless you. To get a proper good bleed, you need to have no high spots, so your oil and fluid needs to always be rising. So it helps with if you're trying to bleed your rear brake, because it actually really helps to, you know, if you've got a bike stand, actually stand the bike up, or you know, you can rest the bike up, and then that way when you're pumping oil in from the bottom. You know, there's no high spot and low spot. It just it's always traveling up, and that's the best way to do it. That might make a really good sound bite, actually, because I've made I make that mistake all the time. I don't do that. I just leave it mounted and do the lazy man's way, and I wonder why. Yeah, it's yeah, it's generally yeah. You'll get ninety percent of the bubbles out, but it's those real little ones. And on the longer hose, you've got more fluid to hold more air, and there's more expansion in the hose because it's longer. Um, and so you actually you'll feel the softer break in the back almost every time, you know, unless you bleed it properly. But yeah, yeah, sure, because I guess the the force that the system can create is in a way not just dependent on the brake system, because some force is lost through the hose by kind of just you can feel it if you squeeze the brake really hard with like a you yep. know I'm not sure if it's every hose or it is, flimsy yeah. hose you can feel the hose expanding. Yeah. Like, man, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it is. And that's one thing, especially so with the Kaha brake, um, I'm running a little bit higher pressure than normal to get the extra brake clamp, right? But because of the higher pressure, the whole system experiences that higher pressure. So your hose experiences more pressure, you know, your piston seals experience more pressure, your caliper experiences more pressure. So you actually end up getting more flex in the whole system. And you get more travel in your finger. And so your brake actually ends up feeling a little bit spongier. But it actually, it's not sponginess from air. It's actually, everything's just flexing a tiny amount and you can feel it. But there's actually an added benefit to that because you get a lot of modulation from it. Because it's essentially like the whole thing's like a spring, you know. So the more you squeeze it, the more it expands. It's like a balloon blowing up. And so... Because of that, you you know to get more pressure, you actually need to move your finger a bit more. Whereas with a brake that's more on-off, you don't actually get to move your finger much, but you get a lot more pressure. So it helps with modulation for sure, but you know it means that if they run stainless braided hoses and a bit higher performance hardware and stuff like that, to be able to do that, you know, if yeah, you put. Right general budget hoses on it you're going to feel the expansion a lot more because they're going to blow up a bit easier there's not a stainless braid holding it together wow that's really cool i never heard that before um is it, am i right like i i swear i did this one time where i put my hand on a caliper yep i don't remember which one and i i swear i felt that thing moving yeah when i squeezed it'll hard. move <laughs> put if you okay i'm gonna say I'm going to say, if you get some calipers, but by calipers, I mean vernier calipers, yeah. um, get some calipers and put them over the caliper and squeeze the brake, you'll see the numbers The numbers move. No way. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. And what that's kind of some, pressure? Uh, can't say for sure. I know what I run, but oh, probably the easiest way to put this in PSI. Hold on. Give yeah, me no, one, no one knows. Um, Metric. I don't even know the other one. Kilopascals, is that it? Uh, yes, yeah, so you got megapascals and kilopascals. Oh, right. yeah. 
but we're talking MPA. Um, I'm going to say like, oh, under a max or like a heavy breaking event, I'm going to guess. It depends on which person, how much they squeeze and all that sort of stuff. And if you're really going shit, I'm going to go over the bars <laughs> and not. But, you know, you could get up to 1,000 PSI. Probably. Wow. Yeah. I hope I got that number right. Um, well, that sounds cool. Yeah, it's it's a lot of pressure. It's like, it's interesting because, you know, I work in the main business. We do, we make aftermarket jewel clutches. And so we're actually working, you know, a pressure and a hydraulic jewel clutch in your car. We're working like an order of magnitude under that, which is insane because like, you know, you'd think your car would have to have in crazy, crazy insane pressures to clamp the clutch. but you've got like seriously high pressures running through your brake. No way. Yeah. That's quite interesting. It's something that blew my mind when I first started crunching numbers on the on this, but yeah. <laughs> Adds an um, extra challenge to it. That's really cool. It's um you mentioned that modulation. I think that would be something really cool to measure because with brake ace we have a modulation metric. Yeah. So every brake event has a modulation score modulation level for it and obviously like your whole ride does too yeah um what but we're not measuring what your finger's doing we're kind of we're measuring the result of that oh yeah so like what your wheel's doing right because we're looking at the changes in your brake torque yep. throughout the event so is it really spiky uh so, so that's what we're looking for for modulation yeah. there was not like a, an actual definition of like how to measure modulation <laughs> yeah so uh that's that's what we made and that's what we called it but that would be pretty cool to be able to measure and like i don't know look at i guess one of the things i always thought is well if we want to know and compare two different brake systems what we would need to know is what the person is doing with their finger but then also the result that is having on the brake system yeah and that's why i've kind of avoided doing like head-to-head brake tests yeah. You know, because you could always maybe squeeze harder. But the problem is, and this is from like a physiological perspective, um, these little muscles in our fingers get pretty pretty tired. Yeah. They're not very strong. So okay. this is one of the things that I believe, and I don't have actually any data to back this up, but I believe this leads to arm pump is, you know, not good brakes. Because you can feel it right away if you change uh, to a better brake system or a bigger rotor. Or longer lever, and you get a greater mechanical advantage over over your brakes, or over your wheel. Yeah. Um, your arms feel better. I can one hundred and ten percent agree with that. And coming from a moto background, so I when I used to race moto, I used to do enduro and things like that, where you were very much on the brake, so, you know, front brake and clutch, and like clutch control was one of the biggest things. And when you're racing a technical race where you've got a lot of clutch, your arms are buggered, like 100%. Like those little little fingers, like moving your fingers leads to arm pump 100%, um, just from my experience. But yeah, that is definitely for sure. Working your finger muscles hard while trying to hold on to a bike, it's that leads to arm pump, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because those those muscles in your finger, like you can, if you do like a fake brake squeeze now, you can feel the muscles all the way in up your, your forearm. forearm. Yeah, because they are connected. Yeah, I actually can't remember my anatomy is kind of escaping me at the moment. I can't remember what that muscle is called, but uh, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll I won't put it in the show notes, but I'm going to be thinking about it tonight, uh, <laughs> wondering what that muscle is called. All yeah. right, so we we just touched on it. We have this a note, rotor thickness slash size, because we mentioned that as something like, okay, you want to make it easier to squeeze your brakes. And I've talked about this uh, in, a, in a few different places. Like, everyone should be running bigger rotors. That's kind of my thing. Actually, that's the shirt I'm wearing right now. It says, ride bigger rotors, and it has a, a photo of the old uh, wired brake sensor we had. Because you had to run a huge rotor. So I was like, well, yeah. I like running bigger rotors. So I'll make sure about it. What do you think about bigger rotors? Because I think it makes it, you don't have to squeeze as hard to get the brake power you need. I 100% agree with that. Um, I think there's things with bigger rotors. Like there's factors, I guess, that we haven't come across yet. Um, 
I'll get into that. But more so, yes. Uh, short answer is bigger rotors, you get more power. Um, simply because you, you know, if it's basically a lever at the end of the day. And, you know, torque is your force in newtons times the length of your lever arm, which is the radius of your disc or half the diameter. So, yes. I guess we yeah. can't argue about it if we agree. No, <laughs> we can't. Yeah, but it's interesting because I guess the word power gets chucked around a lot, which is interesting because it's the same in the automotive industry. And, you know, making clutches and making brakes, at the end of the day, like, powers, I guess power is an interesting metric because, you know, people will throw the term power around a lot, but it's actually torque. You know, mm -hmm. torque is what you're feeling. Um, and power's, power's a little bit different, yeah. But um, is. We do hear that term a lot. And, yeah, that's just one of the things that bugs me because what I had to do for my PhD was measure power in yeah. brakes. And we decided on power because, well, that's what we're doing as... Um, with our legs is we're putting out yeah. power and you can't just measure the force that your legs are putting out because it's no. super important how fast they're spinning yeah but uh you can't just measure the force uh of what the brake is doing because it depends how fast you're going it does yes yeah so and so power i guess in your in your instance power is the correct term because that's exactly what you're measuring yes you're measuring how much torque and how fast you're going yeah and so that is exactly what you're doing, which is, I guess, the right thing to say. Yeah. But yeah, at the end of the day, like you get more torque, which is what you want in, out of your brake. Yeah. Um, but power comes into it because having a bigger rotor does not essentially. Oh, there's like an interesting part here where I'm going to spring into the fact because you've got a bigger rotor you actually have higher surface speeds of where your brake pad is running. So if you think about, you know, you get a tiny little disc, if you spin it at 10 RPM, it doesn't have to carry, like, cover much distance. But if you get a massive disc and you spin it at 10 RPM, you've all of a sudden got to actually travel a lot further. And so one thing, especially with brake pads and friction materials and things like that, the higher your surface speed, the easier it is to glaze your brakes. You know, you can burn them because they're, they're actually rubbing too fast. And, like, you'll notice, I guess it's not so much in the bike industry explained, but with clutch materials and stuff like that, is you can actually only rub them so fast and they're only good for a certain speed or a certain range. Um, and you'll, you'll probably find, like, you know, if you rode your brake at 100 kilometers an hour and you grabbed a handful of brake, you'd probably cook your brake pads, like, straight away or glaze them or something, you know? Mm. And so I guess, like, rotor thing, rotor diameter, you can only go so far without running into issues like that. Right. Kind of like rim brakes. Yeah, exactly. In a way, right? Yeah. That's at, a, at, a, at the biggest diameter possible. And very often I've lost, like, all everything yeah. basically with the rim brakes and that, i guess i never thought of it that way that's actually a nice way to think about it yeah so, so like obviously size though isn't the only thing that we can do like obviously the, so um i think this was in one of the recent episodes that roan and i did where we talked about actually what the what the job is of the brake system is to convert your kinetic energy into heat correct and that heat has to go somewhere exactly you want to protect your fluid from burning as you said yep. Uh, you obviously don't want to glaze anything over. Um, everyone kind of wants light-ish calipers, so there's not a lot of mass there for the heat to go in. But the rotor is a great place. It is for mass. Yeah. And so when you put it that way, that's something exactly what I want to talk about on because I think a lot of people um, a little sometimes get misinformed about where the heat actually has to go because that does. You're right; it has to go somewhere. And so if you can't get rid of it fast enough, you glaze your brakes, you know, um, and you get loss of brake force and all that sort of stuff, and you burn your fluid. Um, you can actually cook your rotors as well. You can get them too hot. Mm. And so there is no downside other than 
you know, weight or rotational inertia of having thick rotors. Um, there are only benefits, you know, having, you get stiffer rotors, there's more mass, thermal in, uh, thermal mass f- f- to absorb the energy. And so you can put more e- energy into them without them raising the temperature, which at the end of the day is what matters to most materials. Um, and it's what m- matters most to the brake pads as well. It's a temperature thing. But you're right. So to go back to that is your heat has to go somewhere. And that's one thing that I've had to do when designing the car heartbreak is I've had to actually put some serious thought about where I want the heat to go. And so your heat can either go from the surface into the rotor or it can go the other way into the pads. And from the pads, it has to go to the caliper. And you actually want to use your caliper efficiently to get rid of that heat energy. Um, You don't want it you know, going straight to the fluid, but you actually want to use your caliper to get rid of the heat. Um, Because if you don't, if you isolate all your heat energy to just your rotor and just your pads, you will almost certainly cook your brake pads. And you'll notice that with like, you know, the SRAMs where they run phenolic pistons and things like that. Those phenolic pistons are thermal insulators. Is that ceramic? Yeah, it's a type of ceramic. And so what it does is it blocks the heat from going anywhere out of your pads. Yes, it will transfer some heat, but generally it's like a therm like you know, it's a thermal wall. Um and so your pads end up cooking because you can't get rid of the heat. Or you end up, you know, getting brake fade and things like that, which is your friction material um is burning up and creating a gas that, you know, separates the brake pads from the rotor and yet you get no friction from it. Um, or you cook your rotors. So you're, there's a special heat treatment on your rotors which um, specifies the hardness. And if you cook your rotors by heating them up too much, you can alter that heat treatment which will end up making your rotors softer, um, which just absolutely destroys your you know, braking performance as well as it decreases the strength of your rotors. So your strength goes down. I guess that's a bit of an engineering. No, that that's great. Actually, the, the whole time you're talking, I'm like, this is awesome. And I'm thinking, I wish <laughs> Rowan was here because he would have some awesome things to say as well. Yeah. Um, do, do you think, I have some rotors, some golfer ones that are 2.3 mil thick, 246 diameter. Yep. And like, they don't fit great in the calipers that I used them with. So I just kind of like put them aside. But I think TRP now is doing a 2.3 mil thick. Yep. I got a set of those to test. Oh, the rotors? Um, yeah, and, and yep. the brakes. I just need to mount them up. I'm trying to do a pad bedding test. Uh, I've so got I'm a set waiting. of those 2.3s as well. Yeah. Do you think like do you think that's a something that's going to continue? Like, are we going to have three mil thick rotor? I think braking <laughs> makes three mil thick rotors. I've seen something come out about that very recently. Yeah, they do some interesting milling and stuff like that on their rotors too. But um. Yeah, I think, you know, we're going to get to a certain point. You know, I don't think we're going to end up having like motor, you know, motor <laughs> sized rotors that are like four or five mil thick. But I think it'll get to a happy medium where, you know, people stop, people get to a point where they're not having issues of burning brakes and things like that. Because, um, yeah, I think, oh, sorry to go back to it, but when, you know, I've seen a few photos float around the internet where people have cooked their Shimano rotors. And those ones are actually stainless on the outside with a, it's laminated with aluminium on the inside. And they get them so hot that the aluminium melts and it actually squeezes out of the rotor. Have you seen a photo of that? I have not, but that sounds ridiculous. I'll send you a photo. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Like you'd have to get them insanely hot to do that. But I've seen it happen a couple of times and it's, it's interesting. But yeah. Um, but to go back to it, I, uh, I don't know if they'll call it a three mil. Like, who knows? You know, if people want it, people are going to make it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I guess I the like, problem is we've always wanted lighter stuff. Like, we've been conditioned to think like that is the epitome of high end on bicycles is if it's lighter. I think so. Like, I definitely have seen that. You know, I would say in the last five to ten years, like 
people have wanted lighter, 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 carbon this, carbon that, lighter this, titanium that. And it's, I guess, I almost feel like it could be at a turning point where people no longer are after the lighter stuff. Like, light, light is good. It's, you know, it's not great to be heavy, but it comes at a cost of performance, you know? And so I think people are kind of at the point where it's like, I'd rather just go out and have a bike that performs great. And so what if it's 100 grams heavier, you know? Yeah. Like, I think a lot of the you know most people that go out and ride are probably in that mindset of i just want to, that works well every time you know i don't care like i don't want to go out and have to suffer having bad this or bad that because it's 100 grams lighter like it's just yeah. not worth it if i carry a full water bottle versus an empty one there's your difference there you know well i think this is where e-bikes are helping because they're kind of like setting the bar like now they're the most high-end bicycles or at least the most expensive right and they're pretty heavy yeah and everyone's oh, yeah. like okay with that and at what everyone's finding is that they descend really really well so if what you're trying to do is have a real good time on downhills and that is now the bar like a yeah. 18 or whatever 20 kg bike yeah well you know that that could only spell good things for the performance of everything that we're using yeah because we'll be more accepting of it yeah so on a total tangent here, um, mineral oil versus dot fluid. Yes. I know you may, like, you offer your brakes in both. I do, yes. That um, sounds like a lot of extra work. And I, why? Like, why is there one versus the other? And, like, what's going on there? So, I first you know the difference between running mineral and running dot is literally it's a material change of your seals at the end of the day that's the just only seals. difference it's just seals and it's because if you cross contaminate so if you use you know dot fluid and a brake that's for mineral or the other way around or you mix the two together for whatever reason um <laughs> what ends up happening is your seals end up absorbing so they take on that oil um because it's of a different molecular structure and all that sort of rubbish but basically they end up swelling and so your seals get super massive spongy and then end up peeling apart and that sort of thing um yet you destroy them you have to throw them away you can't fix them but i decided to offer both because for starters you know lots of people can be quite picky about what they want to run and definitely in different parts of the world certain people like one versus the other well, certain people like one because it's easy to get versus the other. Um, and so I didn't want to rule out, you know, like I'm hand building these at the end of the day. Like it's not at the end of, it's not that much harder for me to offer both because, you know, I'm not stamping them out of a machine and plugging the same seal in every time and like, you know, having to change it for the other bloke. It's like I'm hand building these. So it's kind of like, you know, it's not hard just to hold a different material. Um and as part of that, I've actually changed the color of the mineral seals. So for my seals, I run dot as black and mineral as purple. And then that way, if someone opens them up, you know, they can see, you know, there's going to be data online on my website that says, you know, this material's that instead of having two black seals and going, oh, which one have I actually got? You know, but I'm um, just trying to make it a bit easier. But to compare the two, so dot 5.1, that's like a, it's an SAE standard that's like, you know, for automobiles and stuff like that. So there's this proper standard behind that where manufacturers have to meet certain requirements, which basically ends up dot fluid are very, you know, different brands of dot fluid are very similar. There might be 20 degrees difference in boiling temperature here and 20 degrees here. But because they have to meet the standard, almost certain, like almost every single time they're going to be pretty much the same. Um, which is good and it's bad because with dot you're limited to that standard and you can't branch out and do crazy things to make your fluid boil higher but it means that you can go down to the repco if you really wanted to and buy some cheap dot fluid and you know it's going to perform as dot fluid should because it's going to you know at the end of the day it has to end up going in a car you know and if brakes don't work on cars people die 
Yeah. Same thing with bikes sometimes. But, you know, there's a standard there for a reason. It's because of a minimum requirement to be met. Mineral, on the other hand, there is no standard. There is no requirement. It's you're relying on the brand of fluid that you're buying from, you know. So at the end of the day, it's like you've got no safety net of a standard. It's, you know, up to that manufacturer to withhold their quality and all of that to make a good fluid, mm. which is good in a way because it allows them to do other things and get higher boiling points than you would with DOP. But then again, it's harder to get hold of in some some ways, you know. So uh, I can see how that could lead to a challenge because if a company makes a mineral oil break, like I know people are doing crazy stuff like putting olive oil in there just to like yeah. see how it works, well, which is obviously they, not ideal. They say when if you read through the warranty and the instructions, it says do not use any other manufacturer's fluid other than their own. Yeah. And then that way you have to use it. And if you decide to use olive oil, which you potentially can, I'm not saying go do it, you can <laughs> do it, you know, that's, you can do that. Um, yeah, but people also have tried running. You shouldn't the performance, right? No, no, not at all. Or but it to work at all. If you had no fluid on the planet, but olive oil, you can run olive oil if you want. <laughs> Good Just luck cooking. Go sending it down a massive <laughs> down. Yeah, you know, <laughs> cooking your olive oil. Um, but another thing people have done is use like baby, baby for like mineral oil for babies and stuff like that, um, which can be done, but it's also not recommended. But it's interesting because I I was working on getting some mineral oil from Germany, which is actually it's called Bionol, and it's blended from sunflower sunflowers um which is basically like another vegetable oil but they rate it to i think it's it's like 420 degrees boiling point or something which is like ridiculously high for a brake brake fluid but um yeah not had to actually use that oil yet because you know haven't, haven't managed to to um cook the brakes but yeah i guess that's yeah. the real challenge isn't it like between the two um fluids I guess you just want to make sure that your mineral oil can withstand the temperatures that it could potentially get. Because yeah. as we know, like we want to make sure that the heat doesn't go into the fluid so yeah. that our brake system continues to work. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing with DOT as well is I've actually found, interestingly enough, DOT is easier to clean up than mineral which is a bit of a controversy to what most people think. But DOT, you can generally wash away with water if you wanted. Like water only can wash away DOT because it's hyd hydrophobic. Oh, if, I don't want to get that wrong. But um, yeah, like you can wash away DOT quite easily, whereas mineral oil is, you know, it's the same as washing olive oil off your hands. It's quite oily and you yeah. need a lot of soap to actually break it down and get it away. But the other thing with dot as well is it's quite corrosive. So, yeah. dot if you get it on anything that you like paintwork that you actually want to be there, the dot is just going to peel that off. It takes some time, but it will peel paint off and it will peel stickers off. And well, that's like what that. happened on my brake levers. I guess I didn't wash it properly, and dot fluid kind of yeah. ran underneath my lever, and the paint started bubbling. Yep, that's what happens. And yeah. it's kind of unfortunate. But it does. Yeah. Mineral oil doesn't do that as much, does it? Nah, nah. Mineral oil is pretty fine on most, I'm going to say most, not everything, but I would you say... You still don't want to touch them, no way. Well, like, I think, yeah, you don't want to touch You don't want to get on your hands. Like, you always wear gloves and all that sort of stuff when working on them, but, yeah. Mineral oil doesn't damage stuff, but it's, it's a lot nicer. Like, the other thing with DOT, like, I've found when, like, you know, you're squirting syringes around and sucking up fluid and all that sort of stuff, is actually vaporizes and gets in the air and it's really not healthy to like be breathing that sort of stuff um and i, I have had days like early on when i started working on brakes like i've had dot fluid everywhere like it gets everywhere. in your hair like yeah like i've you know i've had day like back in the early days when i was working on it like your hands like feel like i'd never ever do it again but like i was working on brakes without gloves and stuff for a mm -hmm. significant period of time but um like brake fluid on my arms all over my hands and your hands feel like 
I hate to have to say this, but like, you know how you're in the pool for a long time and your hands get quite, you know, they get wrinkly in that. I've had brake fluid on my hands for that long. That's kind of like done that to my fingers and it feels absolutely disgusting. Um, so always wear your gloves. Yeah. Bit of water that way and wash right off. Oh uh, yeah. But it <laughs> kind of, once it's in your skin, it gets in your skin and it's yeah. horrible feeling. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I've, I think I've had like brake fluid in my mouth and all sorts of stuff. Like hoses coming, you know, just all yeah, because they they there. fling it, they yes. bounce, and when you pull them out or whatever, fling yep. it in your mouth. Yeah, yeah, that's so keep your mouth shut gross. when working on your brakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, cool. I guess you don't have a preference then, mineral oil versus dot fluid. Not overly. I've had to work with both of them so much. That's just so. Like, yeah, I do. I hate dot peeling stuff. I've had dot like peel paint off my handlebars and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But it's much better now. It was like when it back when I first started working on brakes, like I didn't have my bleed bleeding set up sorted. So there was literally oil everywhere. Like I yeah. had no syringes hook, hooked up and all that sort of stuff. So I've got paint missing off my handlebars and everything like that. But um Yeah. No, I do notice though, like the mineral oil feels a lot lighter under the lever. So I think it's it's a little bit less viscous, so it moves better through the narrow ports and the narrow hose and all that sort of stuff. You definitely do notice the mineral is a little bit smoother under the finger um, than the dot, but yeah. Yeah, nice. So if someone wants to get some breaks, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm sure they're inspired by um, your knowledge on breaking. Yeah. They want to check you out. Where can they find you? Hopefully, um, I got like a I've got a website where everything like all, with a bit of a store on it, so people at the moment are placing orders through there, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's um, exciting. So orders are fully functional. So like someone can go and yeah. order your brakes now. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I started started orders at Crankworks last year, um, and at the beginning of this year, I started shipping overseas. So that's all underway now. Um, things are flowing, which is pretty cool. Yeah, there's a. I got a bit of a le- uh, like a wait time, I guess. Um, on breaks, it's a couple of weeks at the moment. Just you know, getting builds out and stuff like that. But that's no, going good. Um, yeah, hopefully, cool. setting up a little bit of a dealer network to help out the guys overseas so they don't have to buy directly from me. But um, is that to help with like anyway. servicing and those kind of things? Yeah, yeah, that's the aim as well. You know, just make it so that in the scenario, like later down the line when they need them service, they don't have to come back here. Although they can if they want to, but yeah, why ship something across the world when you don't need to? You know. Yeah, exactly. New Zealand's pretty far away, but uh, yeah, right. The beauty of the twenty first century. Yeah, we can yeah. send things around. Exactly. Yeah, just try and be efficient, though. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you know. I when someone's ordering something specialized, like boutique, you know, as it's like a different our, story our for is, sure. Yeah, like yeah. generally, you're like, well. That thing's sick. I want it. And if it takes a few more weeks, it's like, eh, you know, yeah. not that big of a deal. But that's that's cool, man. That was a, actually an awesome discussion. We were aiming for about 30 minutes and ended up being a little bit longer than that. But uh, it. yeah, I think, you know, that that was really cool. We talked about some technical stuff. I think I feel like almost feel like we should do it again. Yeah, so, yeah. Might call for a second one, a bit more technical yeah. or something. I don't know. Yeah, cool. All right. I'll put your website and your Instagram uh, down below so someone can check that out and get in touch with you. Thanks, man. That'd be wicked. All right, cool. Catch you next time. All right. See ya.